Kilo was pa. Who's that? That's me. <clears throat> I gotta learn how to hit that note right again. But the OG says, man, they know what that is, man. Um, we are on Twitch though. You can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post, post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if we go live on Kick, YouTube, Twitch, whatever platform we choose to go live on, or we could go live on all three of them. If, but I got a feeling I'm going to like Kick more. Anyway, um, this will be the channel to check it out on, man. Link down in the description. Don't forget, we do got the Patreon. I just started This Is England 90. Um, Fresh Meat is on the chopping board to get started. Next. And this is a list of everything that's on there. And don't forget, we do got the Discord. Let's get into this, though, man. I've honestly, I don't think I've ever reacted to an interview of him or even... I've only seen him get trolled, is what I'm trying to say. I don't really know. You know what I'm saying? What he's all about. Um, but this is Tommy Robinson, the own telling story. And I ain't got no strikes on YouTube, so I'm going to be unfiltered. Don't say nothing I don't like. <laughs> or don't give a vibe, because like I'm here. You're right, Tommy, how are you? I'm right, mate. I should have wore a blazer that fitted me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's how I feel. I feel like I'm in a straitjacket. I put on a bit of weight. <laughs> You're one of the most controversial... Uh... I feel like he's trying to break the tension with jokes. <laughs> controversial figures within the UK. Um, so let's start off. How did it all begin? Is that good, is it? Am I, is that a good thing to be controversial? Um, how, did all, how did it all start? Started in 2009 is when people would have heard of me. Soldiers homecoming parade in Luton. Um, the soldiers were given the freedom of the city to march through. And um, I went down there on a, it was a Tuesday. I went down with my cousins, pay my respects. Um, in that regiment, we had lads from Luton, Scott Mumridge from Farley Hill, who had died, 26 years old. We had another lad who I grew up with, um, same area, and he'd lost his legs, 19 years old. And this regiment were actually, they're brokering pre peace. They weren't out there at war, this regiment. Yeah, they were training, training out there, and, um, and they were attacked. They were called baby killers, but to the Basra, they, one of the soldiers' mums was spat in her face as a large group of Muslims attacked them. Um, it wasn't the fact that they were attacked by the Muslims for me. The, they, this was the final straw for me, yeah? It wasn't the fact that they were attacked. It was the fact that what we found out is that every mosque was leafleted about this event to attack the troops, yeah? We knew nothing, nothing of it. I remember turning up in the morning and seeing police everywhere. I think there's a lot of police here. And I remember looking over and seeing 30 women in burqas, full niqabs, 30 of them together. And then I saw Saif al-Islam, the sword of Islam. He's the main radical. Remember, at this time, there was a group called al and, um most people in the country wouldn't know who they were. 60% of the terrorists in jail were ex-members of this group. This is Abu Hamza, Omar Bakri, the world's most famous terrorists run this group. Do you know where their head office was? It was in Biscuit Mill in Luton. <laughs> their head office was literally in, in our town. And they used to recruit every Saturday outside Don Miller's Bakery, every Saturday. They're there with their pace tables. They were openly, uh, openly talking about and praising the fact that they were sending people to fight out against British forces. And the soldiers had the freedom, and I remember watching, I stood and watched at our town hall as the police opened the town hall, and they marched this group of bearded Muslims through the town hall. I remember thinking, what's going on here? And then just heard all the commotion. The police had marched them through and took them out the back to be right on the front, from me to you, of our soldiers. And they spat and they attacked and they screamed. Um, and listen, on their, their views on the war, I'm totally sympathetic. Yeah? An unjust war. Millions of people disowned, uh, killed in a war for money. Um, take that to the government. Yeah? Go scream in the politicians' faces for all you want, I'd support you on it. Our soldiers swear allegiance to Queen and country, they don't choose which war they go into. Yeah? They're put in difficult positions and in those wars they had their hands tied behind their back at the same time. So, um, so I, it was upsetting for everyone. It, it was emotional for me to, to watch what they'd done. 
uh, on a day that we're supposed to be showing our pride and our respect in the men that are, 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 whose job it is to protect us. Um, they were attacked and it was the fact the police took them through to do it. So then our, in response to that, I set up a group called the United People of Luton. Um, and we attempted, and it wasn't straight after that, it was, there was a St George's Day parade, two weeks later, and there was a massive hysteria over what had happened in Luton. And every time you hear of Luton, or anyone, anyone in the country hears of Luton, it's to do with terrorism. Whether it be the Stockholm bother, the fertiliser bomb plot orchestrated and planned from Luton, there was one of the Al-Qaeda masterminds, a guy called Q, yeah? He was a taxi driver and also worked in a chicken shop in Luton. He's one of the masterminds of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> <laughs> he's, right, he's just working in the chicken shop. But that's the day to day, yeah? So when this group, uh, Roger, Roger Ibrahim, he, called it, he changed his name to Ibrahim Hansen. I used to hang around with him as a kid. He's, what, he's the big ginger convert radical. He's now in jail for terrorism. Safe. Most of them are all now in prison for terrorism. But at the time, they had free reign in the town. They were recruiting and radicalising. And um, so I remember watching it that day and thinking, uh, previous to this, this is 2009. In 2004, when they first come to light for us, they were, that's when they were sending people to fight against our forces in 2004. I organised a, a demonstration called Ban the Luton Taliban. And I literally got our football element of supporters, of lads, and I went to Don Miller's. We went on a Saturday to, to let them know they're not allowed there. On the, and uh, they're not allowed to recruit for terrorists in our town centre. Like, the police might think that's okay, the council might support that, whatever's going on, but they're not. To, to us and uh, and they weren't there that day it worked but then the fallout from that I was targeted and I was what was I then I was 21 young lad I was targeted by the not the radical jihadists but the Pakistani drug gangs for years then after that so when the English Defence League come about and I watched this I wanted to say something and I wanted to make a stand about it but I also knew the consequence hence the name Tommy Robinson and I wore a mask for no one knew who I was for a year it took a year before I was exposed to who I was. So I was reading on the internet, there's all this hysteria about who is this guy and who's the leader? And people saying, no, oh, it's the government, it's the government, they're trying to bring in martial law. That's what the far right was saying. It's all planned and no group can become this big, this quick um, with PR and all this. And it, and, and it, because it did just go like that. Even for me, man, I was working on a building site and phew, within a couple of months, I was leading the biggest, biggest street protest movement Europe's seen. And it was like, whoa. That's well, Tommy. So, when did you start getting these these views and ideas yourself? Uh, Me. So the, it, it it was so 2009 was the cutoff point, and it, and I remember saying at that. I feel like he's trying to make it sound like, or it sounds like, I started this for a just cause in my mind. Now the people who backed me might have had this element to them. That you know, that racial, that racist element to it. That's what I heard. <laughs> At time when it happened, I said, "If we don't do something now, yeah, in Luton, if we don't do something about these men, then what's next? Yeah, but They've just attacked our troops. Yeah, next is a soldier's funeral. Next is a primary school of kids. Next, the, 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 and, and it was the fact that they're given free reign. It's like the council and the police had never said no. So, like, you can go if you. Okay, the way he making it sound sound right about like. Okay, the police won't do the right thing, so let me get together with with whoever will come and do the right thing. If, if that's the case for this particular incident, then shit, well, hey, okay. But I'm pretty sure there's been a ton of stuff that's happened that was the real reason why people don't like them. If you go put in anti-Gaza war protest, Luton, you'll see Safe al Islam, Sword of Islam, leading thousands, yeah? And they're marching out and they're, they're singing Kayuba, Kayuba. They're, they're, they're singing about um, a historic, and I look at everything, because I'm, I'm from the town. And I'm looking, they're all wearing balaclavas and they're shouting about death to the Jews, yeah? And Kayuba, Kayuba, so Mohammed massacred 600 Jews, beheaded them all, yeah, back 1400 years ago. And that's what they're chanting about. They're chanting about the Jews. And, and also there was, um, when Jewish families remembering the Holocaust in Luton, when I was probably about 18, loads of Muslims turned up outside the town hall. Not, well, don't lay the loads of Muslims, loads of jihadists, this group. And they had kids with them and they had to barricade and lock themselves inside the town hall. Caught himself. I'd see this group and they had kids with them and they had to barricade and lock themselves inside the town hall. I'd seen, I, I got, the first opportunity I get, if, you, if anyone goes on YouTube and puts in Tom Robinson, Oxford University, 
you'll see an address I've, I, I gave there, which has had now three, four million views. It's one of my only videos that's still online, yeah? But um, it was the first opportunity I got to say to people, because people know me, you know me by headlines, you judge me by those headlines, yeah? You don't know where I'm from, you don't know right. my upbringing, you don't know what I've seen. It was the first opportunity I got to give those people, I said like, Listen, take yourself out of your comfort zone because you're all at your Oxford University, so you probably have quite privileged upbringings. Yeah? Some of you may not have, but I doubt very much many of you are from a working class upbringing. Yeah? Let me take you through my life growing up. For example, when the Twin Towers hit in, uh, in September 11th, on my estate, we had magnificent 19 posters of the 19 suicide bombers where they were celebrated. Yeah? And I showed all this in the Oxford Union speech. I showed the posters. I said, look, like, when you went to the shop after that, you might not have seen that. Whoa. For real? Well, that's what I saw. Yeah? You might not have had a relative. I've had, we've had a relative who was groomed, raped by gangs of Pakistani men. Yeah? And the police done nothing other than tell, us, tell the family that she's a drug addict. Yeah, she's 14 or 15, hooked on heroin, sold to them by the gangs. Yeah? That is, that they've got her. This is the whole grooming. So when I done, first that, done that demonstration in 2004, yeah? banned the Luton Taliban, I made leaflets. And the leaflet is true to my word to today. Yeah? It's true to what, everything I say today. Muslims are not a problem. Individual Muslims are not a problem. In, right? We're talking about radical Muslims and radical gangs. I said, in, I said in that leaflet, whites and blacks are being racially and religiously targeted in this town. Yeah? And no one's doing anything about it. Yeah? It was never about whites, simply, because I, I, I'm from Luton. White English people are minority. I mean, you line up all the people I love, the vast majority of them aren't white. Yeah? But... The <laughs> Every time I hear white, I mean, a, a Caucasian person say that, it'd normally be a red flag, but I'm hearing them right now. I do hear them a little bit. I need to see these leaflets and these, these I need to see the evidence. These are the issues that need speaking about. So I done that in 2004. I spoke about the issues. And when the English Defense, when the English Defense League was formed, it was just enough's enough. And I said, like, something's got to change you, yeah? Look so thus far, like I said, I feel like he's done all of this. This is what is make. If I was somebody who didn't know about him or nothing, I'll be looking at this like, oh, okay, he's fighting for a just cause. Is what it sound like. And, but then the groups that he put together were just a bunch of people, though, that he can't control who joins the groups, but a bunch of people who have some similar views, but also have some wilder views that are not the same as his, if you get what I'm saying. Because I've watched the town change. I've watched the freedom disappear. I've watched the council, and I'll give another example of this. Um, when, the, when we started the English Defence League, the council, after about 12 months, they set up a meeting with me, Luton Council, and they invited me down. They put a camera down like this, and they had about 10 of them sat there. And a Baroness, they sent her to choose. All I can see is Nico and the, Nico, Nico and the, Olana, oh, 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 Olana, I can't even say his name. I can only think of him right now, that's crazy. There's a black lady, a Baroness, come, and there was all councillors and all Luton Council. And they invited me down, they put a camera down like this, and they had about 10 of them sat there. And a baroness, they sent her, she was a black lady, a baroness come and there was all councillors and all, all these important people anyway. And they said, tell us what's wrong. I said, oh, I'll tell you what's wrong. And there was 10, uh, ten of them, there was one Muslim chap there. I said, where do you live? St Albans. Where do you live? Like Harpenden. Where do you live? Hitchin. Where do you live? Yeah. I went through where all of them lived. None of them lived in Luton. Yeah. I said, you live in Luton, didn't you? To the Muslim fella. I said, yeah. You represent your community. I said, you lot are trying to represent us. You don't know who we are, in the sense of you're not from the same upbringing as us. You haven't lived on the, street, the streets of a town like this, you know? You don't understand what we're talking about. And I said, and I'll do another thing, and I've done it with a journalist. I went up to the, so Farley Hill, which has changed demographically now, yeah? But Farley Hill was one of the most uh, poorest, deprived estates in the country, okay? White working class estate in Luton, yeah? And I took, I took them out, I said, you see this park? Yeah, that's from the 1970s. Look at the state of this, yeah? Look here. This is what, and you see this recreation centre. If, our, if the kids on here want to go play in there, they've got to pay five, three pound a head or four pound a head. Let's go down the hill to the Muslim community. That's a 350,000 pound of the state of the art park, yeah? That's what they've got, yeah? Let's go, let's look at, everything's free. 
Yeah. Everything's free because they regen they classed it as a regeneration area, the entire Muslim community. So the kids want to go to the recreation centers. It's free. Yeah. I said, like, you have forgot us and, and neglected us. Yeah. And that's a fact. And, and these sorts of things are the reason that currently white working class kids are the biggest academic failures in, in, in the UK. Yeah. Um, if you look look through my when we look at minorities, if we talk about um, going to university, I think it's only 8% of white children, white working class kids, who are on free school meals end up at university. It's nearly 30 or 40% of, 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 of diverse minorities. There's reasons for this, yeah? And, and this is, so when I'm talking to the council, I said all these things. I said like, listen, this, this is what you've done. And I said, and, and... Comparison does something. Comparison... If you compare and compare and compare to what you do and you don't have, instead of going out and just going to go change the situation, it, it's, it'll do something to you on the inside. You know what I'm saying? It'll really do something to you. It'll make you evil. And you don't even know you're becoming that evil person. But all I can hear right now is comparison, 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 and comparison. I feel like the people that's coming over there, who who he said it, it was it was uh, all free because it was it was something right reclassification or something. What did he say? Um, I feel like they stopped comparing and went out and did something at that point, though. You know what I'm saying? Everybody there is not not Taliban, though. You get what I'm saying? They're not the negative. What about the people that are? They deserve. What about the people that come? They come across, or they come from where they come from, war torn, and never had nothing, haven't had a good meal, and you know what I'm saying? They deserve it too. They deserve, you know. I don't know. Like they, they, y'all been there. I'm just hypo I'm just speaking hypothetically. Like I don't know all of it, but y'all from Luton, right? But y'all been there. You saying we forgot about y'all? No, no, I don't think they forgot about y'all. But y'all been there. What What are y'all doing to change the situation? Besides, you know what I'm saying. But I also get that there was probably a not a, was a lack of opportunity in certain areas. I don't know. I'm just you know. Hypotheticals, that one stuff. I don't know. With the Muslim fella, he said, "Yeah, well, we are, we're against the extremists." I said, "Mate, I'll go online and show you a video where thousands come out of Barry Park, and the men they're led by, Al Mujahideen, this terror, this now prescribed terrorist organisation, they are the Nazis of the millennium. That's who they are. Yeah? Let's not pretend who they are. They're the most radical extreme jihadists. Now, if they were Nazis, you'd never see the rest of Luton or our community following Nazis. They're following Nazis. If I open my curtains tomorrow." and I see uh, bomber jackets, Dr. Martin Boots, and promoting hatred against everyone that's not white, they're getting removed by us yeah? in Luton. We're removing them, and we've had this stance from day dot. We'd be removing them. I said, you haven't removed them. You haven't even confronted them. Yeah? This group have been in, and I try to explain it in the sense that Berry Park is a small, close-knit Muslim community, yeah? and they say these numbers are small, 200 al Mujahideen activists, yeah? but they're very dedicated and they operate every day of the week, outside mosques, uh, setting up pace tables, radicalizing. If you don't, if, you, if we reverse the roles and you have a close-knit white English community and the rest of the town is not white yeah, and not Muslim, and in this, in this little close-knit thing, there's 200 Nazis, yeah, and all they do all day is promote hatred against everyone that's not, that's not white. Yeah? If you don't think you're gonna see an explosion of violence, an explosion of problems coming out of that community, you're insane. Yeah? And what we've seen, and only when we formed the English Defence League, I actually contacted the Luton, so when we formed the United People of Luton, we held one rally, the police stopped us, they stopped us getting to the War Memorial, and the reason, so we wanted to get to the War Memorial to pay our respects, and they blocked us, and they kept with us for three hours, my auntie had to urinate in the street, the police come up to us, and they put their hands, they, they, they searched us, they put their hands in my pockets, all of us lined us up, they made us take our shoes off, I said, I watched that you walk them through the town hall, yeah? You walked jihadis 
like most people didn't know what a jihadi was at that time. Yeah? We, I did, because I've been researching. I said, you walked extremists from our town hall to sack us, and here you are stopping searching us. And then they didn't just stop and search us, they smashed most of the lads with batons on horses. There's a video. Put in United People Loot, and you'll see the first demonstration. And that, after the way they treated us in the first demonstration, like, they created, they created me. They created, yeah. Oh, just take curiosity then. Do you reckon if you wasn't born in Luton, you'd still have the same views? No, not all. No, 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 no. If I wasn't born in, not at all. Because when I, I remember doing a debate. Yeah, that's not a. Well, you said some of the same views now because he wasn't a product of that environment at the point at that time, right? That's you can ask that question to anybody. The answer is going to be no. As well with uh, I wasn't born in, not at all because. When I, I remember doing a debate as well with, uh, on multiculturalism and I was discussing it with this professor and when we got on the live stream, it's, it's, on, um, it's on some Russian channel and he's from the UK and I said, oh mate, where, where are you? And he was in Brussels. <laughs> I said, you're in Brussels, okay. Where were you born? Exeter. You grew up in Exeter. Yeah. And you're the expert on multiculturalism. I said, mate, 99.999% white, yeah? That's where you've grown up. And you're going to tell me that I know nothing, yeah, in the town that I've grown up. I said, that's like reading a book on bricklaying and thinking you can build a house, bro, yeah? You have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Hey, he not wrong. Hey, he is not wrong. Hey, he is not wrong. Like, like, let me put it in perspective. Like, that's like somebody with zero views... Zero subs telling me how to get subs. Huh? <laughs> okay. What's somebody telling you get what I'm saying? That's how he just broke it down. But he ain't wrong on that particular And story. I think that my, my experience in multiculturalism and growing up in that town is where I have the because some people say I saw I saw David Cameron say multiculturalism has failed. Yeah, he come out and made a speech saying that. Angela Merkel come out and said a, a speech saying that. A lot of the leaders come out, and that's a weak, coward's way out. Yeah, because multiculturalism hasn't failed. If you come to Luton, yeah, it, it, in the sense that you line up all my friends, we're all sons of immigrants. You know, my mum was an Irish immigrant. We, when my mum come here, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Yeah, we are all. Oh, okay. When your mum got to Luton. Okay. Yeah, my mum was an Irish immigrant. We, when my mum come here, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Yeah? We are all from that stock and that background, but if you, we're all integrated and assimilated. Yeah? What's failed is Islam. The Islamic community have failed to integrate, and you're blaming everyone else. No one can sit here and tell me the Sikh community have failed, to, and, they're, and they're, they've, they've been a failure in multiculturalism in the UK. You just can't do it. The biggest homeowners, the most successful business owners, yeah? family oriented. Then, so certain communities like that, the Hindu, the Sikh, the Jewish community, what, you're just going to throw them because cause they haven't failed. Yeah? The Irish community didn't fail. The, the, no, we haven't failed yeah? to integrate. Islam has, and there's reasons for that. There's a reason why there's Islamic ghettos. There's a reason why there's non-integration. There's a reason why there's no assimilation. There's reasons for it, and it's to do with Islam. And so, that's, so I've always spoke about Islam, yeah? And Islamic immigration and the problems from Islam. So I've always separated that. I've, I've never been anti-immigration in, in its whole sense. As well, who was your biggest influences growing up? Growing up, uh, my... Do you mean just growing up or do you mean in my politics? Both. Um, Most... He keep fixing that jacket. That motherfucker ain't gonna get no looser, my boy. It's just... You might as well get white teed up like me. It's over with. Not so growing up. Growing up, my... My dad, um, who's actually my, my stepdad, but he's not, he's my dad. Tell me more. Uh, uh, he's a Scottish, Scottish man um, from Glasgow, a hard-working man, um, a great father. Um, Are there any siblings? Uh, yeah, I've got one. So my, my, my real dad, yeah, I ain't seen my real dad probably since I was about 11. But I only used to see him on birthdays as well. Like, he'd turn up on birthdays and I didn't call him dad, I called him Malcolm. Because he didn't warrant being called dad, yeah. Your dad's name was Malcolm. Um, I don't think DNA makes you a father as such. So I, so yeah, my dad, and then, and my mum was one of eight children, large, large Irish family. Um, so I looked up to, I guess even I, I looked, I, I heard a lot about football violence as a young kid because uh, a lot of my mum's brothers were involved in that scene. 
uh, hooliganism. Uh, in Luton, it's called the Luton Mig Mix. It's the Men in Gear. It's a football gang. Um, Luton Mix. And so I. Mix is the Men in Gear. It's a football gang. Um, and so I would have looked up to a lot of the men involved in that, or, or listened to, and main, and, and even that. I think that's what. So Luton's football firm it was known throughout the country as being diverse, white and black. So the men I looked up to growing up were Rasta men because they were the most respected on the terraces. I feel like he's just trying to explain himself a lot. Like he wants, like he's trying to get like, like, you get what I'm saying? Like it just feels like he's just trying to prove himself to be other than what people say he is. A lot of explanations going on here. My friend is this, my friend is that. Okay. But the men I looked up to growing up were Rasta men because they were the most respected on the terraces in Luton. But that's just part, and then I think that searching for identity, which most people are, most people joining the English Defence League were searching for identity. Most people, I think, who convert to Islam are searching for identity. I think we're in a total identity breakdown, um, especially if you're English, because I feel that every other group is encouraged to celebrate who they are. Yeah? And again, I'll give you an example. For St. Patrick's Day in, in Luton, there's a three-day festival. So if you're Irish, there's a big, massive celebration where everyone's proud to be Irish, yeah? and they're allowed to be proud to be Irish, and great, great, yeah? For St. Lucian's, there's a St. Lucian festival, they have fairground rides and parks. When it's Eid, there's a massive, well-funded, I think the government, the council pay money into it, fairgrounds, e everything up in the park. St. George's Day banned, banned. That's what I grew up watching, yeah? And I remember ringing, when, so at the start of the English Defence League, when it was like, hold on, we need to start challenging a lot of these things. I rang up Icknield High School, it was St. George's Day, and Nick Neal High School sent out um, a letter to all the parents, my mate's kids were there, saying, if anyone brings in the emblem of St George, they'll be sent home from school. And I rang up the school and said, Look, we, went, we put banners all around the school after. I said, what, what's going on? Yeah? Well, well, you can celebrate your out of school hours. Yeah? Okay, when Pakistan won the cricket at the same school, yeah? you flew Pakistan flags. Yeah? But the English kids, so what are you telling the English children? That they should be ashamed of who they are that they can't celebrate who they are, that they have that loss of identity. And I think I even search, was searching for an identity. I think I found mine at football. Yeah? That's where I found my identity, my part of that football culture. Um, but that, so that is a problem, a big problem. No, that is a problem. I hear you. That is a problem. The way he just broke it down, that sounded like a problem to me. When you can't identify and be proud of who you are as a person, that is wrong when other people are allowed to and you can't. It's just, you know, you can't be over extreme about it, but he, I don't think that's the case in this, this particular incident he's talking about. Across the UK. That's why instead of Cockney rhyming slang, most people are speaking Jim African, yeah? They're searching to be someone they're not. And I think it's important to install who you are, historically who you are, where you've come from, um, and pride in that. Because if you had pride, if we had pride, even when I look at Luton, I think, if you had pride, none of this would be happening. But we've lost our pride. Lost our pride in everything. As well, has, obviously with your views being um, very controversial, have any of your family turned, your, turned their back on yourself or any friends? Um, yeah, I've had problems since Black Lives Matter. A lot of problems. Which has been the most upsetting time, I'd say, for me. Um, because I wear the hat being against Islam. If I walk out that road and someone stabs me to death, yeah? I believe in that. Yeah? When I made uh, comments against Black Lives Matter, a lot of people took it as oh, I was against blacks. I can't wear that hat because that's not who I am. Yeah? What was the comments and, uh, against Black Lives Matter? Because I got comments for them too. I don't back Black Lives Matter. Let's be real. Beca because there were individuals within that group that took advantage of what was going on. And as a whole, I cannot back that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's tainted. But I, you know, I still step, I'm still prideful, I still, you know, believe in the freedoms that should be had and, and things of that nature. But on my own, not, I, I, you know what I'm saying? I rock with that. But that organization, I'm good. Um, 
Black Lives Matter as an organisation, I, I think, again, it comes down to, it comes down to ignorance. Most people think Black Lives Matter formed after George Floyd. I've been watching it for 10 years prior to that. Yeah? I've been watching what, how it formed, why it formed. Every time there's an election, it comes back up. It uses narratives and pushes agendas. It's controlled and run by George Soros, who's a Hungarian Jew, not a black man. Yeah? Um, none of the money that's funneled in through it goes to black people. Um, it's just, just total farce. And if you go on the, if you go on there, and uh, what was the, what exactly did the bro say? Let me go look it up. Tommy Robinson, Black Lives. Oh, it's a whole five minute video. Oh. The website. This is what really annoys. It just said the origins and how he feels on it. He's probably speaking, saying exactly the same thing that he said before. To me, yeah. You go on their website and it says the f the goals of Black Lives Matter was to break down the nuclear of the family. Goal number one: break down the nuclear of the family. Yeah. And this is where this is the real racism. Yeah. They want to break down the nuclear of the family. In the 1960s, 80 percent of young black children in the United States had a mum and a dad together. Yeah? Now it's 20 percent. That's planned. That hasn't just happened. Yeah? There's organizations, there's funding that plan that. Okay? The breakdown of the family. What does that lead? I agree. I agree. I'm not even going to lie. When he's talking about this, me being black from America, yes, in the 60s, there was a full home. When, 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 when the government gave out public aid or in housing, and gave out public aid and housing, you couldn't have a man in the home. You could only be a single mother. So women were kicking men out on purpose to get the aid from the aid that a little bit right about that now. As far as I know, he's right about that. This is these are truthful statements coming out out of his mouth and in when he's speaking on this. I can't I can't say about nothing else, but for this and in my research, what I came across. It's 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 flush with it. It's I heard the same stuff. Leave. At least people rely on the state. At least people in poverty. Okay. The breakdown of the family. What does that leave? At least people rely on the state. At least people in poverty. It leaves them instead of growing up respecting and looking up to their dad and aspiring to be like the man who's working in the house. They grow up and respect the gangs, and the rap gangs. So. Well, <laughs> well, you know. I Public, I mean, like, when a dad is forced out of the home and public aid is given and housing is given and, and government assistance is given because you can't get, go you couldn't, I don't know if it's still the same, you couldn't get government aid when it first started if you had the male in the home. It was only for single parents that needed help. And every, every black family needed help. Mom, dad, if there was a couple, they still needed help. But, you know, dads would move away and not be in the home so parents could get get that. But, you know, at the same time, that was leaving a lot of kids fatherless. Like, now, or fatherless, maybe fathers were still involved, but they weren't in the home. You know what I'm saying? And that do, that do do a lot. That can turn you into some things, and a product of your environment type situation. All of these things, that's, that was the, one of the main points. I think this is the reason we're in this mess. It, it, black people are stuck in poverty, and you've purposely kept them there, yeah? And when I say you, I, I mean the elite. I mean the Democrat party, the people who have still got them on plantation. It's still going on. If you really think about it, look at, um, look at, um, Look at, uh, cause I, I don't have these problems with my baby mamas. You know, we're not we're not on that type of time. But look at, uh, man, what is it called? <laughs> Where the woman collect money from child support. Look at child support. You be in a thriving, great relationship. As soon as you have a kid, uh, -uh we arguing now because I I can see I see you as you. I could probably get more money out of you separately. And, and it's, it's built against the black man, the man in general. Let me not categorize it, categorize it as black. Child support is against men. 
is what I've seen. It always leans towards the woman. Any government, subs, anything that's given something to from the government, it always leans towards women to help, and which it should. Let you know. Some women, not all, started weaponizing it. United States. They're stuck in this cycle of being the Democrat Party, the people who have still got them on plantations in the United States. They're stuck in this cycle of poverty because they're breaking your family. Yeah? The most important thing is family. The most important thing is a family unit and you're destroying it and purposely destroying it. Whether you're attacking the church, whatever you do, you are breaking down the family. And Black Lives Matter, that's their sole purpose. Their other purpose is to promote LGBTQ+. I don't know how many black people that want to promote that. And, and when, when we're talking about LGBT, I'm pro gay people's rights, yeah? It's gone past that. Where we're at now with this whole transgender rights, transgender um, mission, yeah? To sit in front of six-year-old children and have these sat at, doing nursery rhymes or whether to, that you are sexualizing children, yeah? And you're confusing them. And the percentage of children now that are non-binary or feel like this, it's insane. They're kids. Let them be kids, yeah? And this whole push is the attack. That's what I, and, and all of it I see as, as planned, so yeah. What impact um, has your views had on yours and your family's life? Oh. Shout out to the community. Oh, that's, the, that's where it's... They're my views, which is where I get... They're my views. They're not my children's views, they're my views. And, um, and you know, so... So, 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 pe so even my, for my own children, when I, because my kids didn't know who Tommy Robinson was, or that I was leader of the English Defence League when they're this big, this big. Yeah. So I had that time when my son, when my daughter was first going from uh, the lower school to the middle school. Yeah. And I had to, and the school were like, you need to tell them, yeah, because we'd protected and shielded them from it. So then I had to sit them down and explain that there's a lot of people that don't like your dad. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that say I represent something and I stand for something that I don't. Now remember, all my kids would have seen is, is a diverse group of friends. Yeah? They're, they, all they're the witness. So they, they know I'm not racist. They know who I hang around with. They know uh, that upbringing. So, but I had to explain that to them. And, 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 and for example, I've got, I've got a friend, Sully, whose mum is a black Kenyan Muslim and his father's white. And uh, even when I was leading the English Defence League, I, had, I, I moved out of town to like a little village and there was about 12 houses in a row and I invited them all to, it was uh, St George's Day. So we've got bouncy castles for kids and I invited all the neighbours and then my friends come from Luton. I remember Sully's mum was sat there, she's got a hijab on and her phone's gone and she's laughing. She said, you ain't gonna believe where I am. And obviously her friend's saying, where? So I'm, like, I'm at Tommy Robinson's St George's Day event, yeah. And, uh, and she's laughing, I'm laughing because, but people who don't know me, yeah, we just think I hate every Muslim or something, yeah. That's, how, that's, how, that's what's portrayed. And I remember with my kids, I said, like, kids, you know, you know Sully, yeah? You, you know the love we have together. He's one of my best friends, yeah? You know the respect I have for him, yeah? But I talk about the religion, okay? So when I'm talking about religion, yeah, I'm not talking about him. I separate, and I try to separate, and you have to separate. People from ideas. Islam is an idea, yeah? And Muslims are people. I believe that they're... Um, I, I've gone through this with lots of them. I believe many of them are cultural Muslims. They, they don't... I'm just trying to listen and not say nothing, man. <laughs> Follow the book to the word, thankfully. Yeah? They're not that strict or devout, thankfully. But, um, but they're part of their identity as being Muslim. So when I talk about Islam, they feel under attack. Yeah? They feel like I'm attacking part of them, which I'm not. It's, and and if, if I was criticising the Bible, I'm not attacking every Christian, am I? You're allowed to, you're allowed to criticise the Bible. You no, but, you know... Christians go by the Bible, so you, they feel like that would be attacking them. So I get why the group that does not, you know, I, I get why the why it go the other way as well. I was gonna say that earlier. In fact, it's celebrated to be anti-Christian and, 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 and mock Jesus. You know, I had to talk about Islam without being branded a racist, which I find insane. So what repercussions has there been on your family? And, it, loads, it, it, and what would be the worst? Um, people at the house, children having to move their home. Uh, probably moved home seven times, eight times. The fear, I've seen the fear in my kids. The upset, I've seen the problems. So, for example, um, someone come to the house and they live streamed it 
and I weren't in the country. So I landed back off the plane and I had messages from my son saying, Dad, please, please, get home, get home. And they were hiding. And uh, these people come and they were sent to the house. It's all, again, it's organised. They come to the house. The fallout of that was from that day, they couldn't go back to the house, yeah? So they had to move and we sofa surfed until they found somewhere else to, to, to get the property is pretty hard when you're Tommy Robinson as well. Even to rent one, no one wants to rent you one either. So that caused the separation of um, me and my ex-wife, this issue. Because then they had to move. And my, ch- my daughter, for example, had like one behavioural incident in the year before. She had 44 in the next two months. Thank so you. I witnessed the psychological, the, the emotional damage, the, the fear done, having to move done. And they've had that a lot. They've had that a lot. They've seen things that be- kids shouldn't have to see. They've heard. I'm be real, like you could, you like if I if I was in his shoes, as soon as that type of stuff would have start happening and affected my kids, I would have been up out of there. I'd have been like, you know what? Nothing's more important because he already said it. Family's number one. So at the end of the day, I would have had to put my pride to the side and be like, look, man, my family is f- unprotected right now. They feeling the pressure of what I got going on, so I'm gonna step back. Me personally. But even recently, I don't know if you've watched it, I'm making a series, you've heard threats to, that I've had phone calls from men who I know who they are, yeah? and I've recorded them and given to the police. A Muslim gentleman who says uh, he's gonna kidnap my daughters and rape them, and get them outside school and rape them. He's not been arrested, I find it mad. None of them get arrested. Um, there's been, so, so, so even like there's six, there's six lads in jail, they got sentenced to 25 to 30 years, they're on their way to kill us. So my views have, have caused fear, like fear for me. Yeah. On but, reflection of that, do you think it's worth it? Um, I wouldn't change a single thing. I know that sounds mad. Yeah. I know that sounds mad. I've tried to explain this. You remember, imagine trying to say, I say to lads, well, you think you've been in the doghouse, mate? Yeah. Three times in the first six months in uh, the English Fence League, my, house, my doors were booted off by the police. My missus was six months pregnant. She got arrested on money laundering charges. She got bailed for two years. Didn't come to anything yet, but this, is, this was part of their pressure. Um, the targeting, I said to that, I've had all of that. But I believe the issues I speak about are far superior to me and my family. Yeah? I talk about issues that affect a generation of young girls in this country. And, I wait, and when I talk about this, I'll, I'll give you an example again. I obviously, most people know I was... I, got, I need y'all to give me like a... Tag me in some type of... Like one of these where he like... Because obviously he's on here, you know, bigging himself up. Making himself kind of completely opposite of what everybody has believed him to be, but I need to see some of the some of the speeches or some of the some of the some of the stuff that made him who he is today in people's eyes over there. Um, because I know with men like this, man, a lot of the times it's it's how you say it. You know what I'm saying? If he would just deliver the message a little bit differently, but you know, that's neither here nor there. It's too late now. But I'm saying that's, sometimes it just be how you say stuff that be coming off mighty aggressive and mighty left, left or right or whatever side. I was arrested outside the court case in Leeds. Um, there was, I obviously most people know I was arrested outside the court case in Leeds. Um, there was 30 men on trial and I asked one of them, as he walked into court, watched the video, yeah? I asked him, how are you feeling about your verdict? That's it, yeah? I was taken off the streets and within two hours, I was doing 30 months in jail. Yeah. And the man who actually, I asked him, how are you feeling about your verdict? He was let go home by the judge and he, and he disappeared to Pakistan, still hasn't faced justice, yeah? Insane. But most people celebrated the fact I was put in jail. But I was put in jail and on appeal, it turned out that everything they'd done was un- unlawful and illegal. Yeah? So they had to release me out after spending 14 weeks in solitary confinement, they released me out of jail. And th- that sparked mass protests, like a worldwide, 30,000 people marched on parliament. They were protests in uh, Australia, American congressmen flew in to, from the United States to speak at protests. Um, I think of Brownback, Congressman Brownback, Trump asked a uh, congressman, tra- Trump asked Y'all heard that? What's 
One thing about that I don't like about this crib, man. I be hearing too many, too much stuff. And I got PTSD, man, from living in Chicago and a lot of stuff I done been through. Any little sound, especially when I be having these headphones on, be throwing me off. It is um, liaison with the British government to speak about my safety, yeah? All of these things were blowing up. And, um, and I come out of jail and I was released from jail. And then I produced a documentary called Panodrama, which was an expose of Panorama, proof that they were lying, proof that they were altering footage. I've sent someone undercover into Panorama, they were doing a film about me, and I destroyed them. There was no Panorama. You know, they couldn't even bring their film out and the main man had to lose his job. Although you wouldn't have read about this in the media because not one journalist reported on it. The doc you should watch the documentary, it's a good documentary. Yeah? This happens and because I published this doc good promo, documentary, within 48 hours I was cancelled from every single social media. Damn. Everyone. Within 48 hours. That documentary had 2 million views on Facebook alone in 48 hours, and I was deleted. And I wasn't just deleted, they brought charges against me for the case I'd previously been in jail for. So they brought charges against me at the Old Bailey for asking a paedophile how he felt about his verdict, because they were all convicted, those men, yeah, for raping kids. I just asked him on his way in, how are you feeling about your verdict? So they recharged me, and, um, and, then, and then they... I got strikes for doing the videos on that, so... They, they offered me a deal. If I apologise and plead guilty, yeah, that I can go to court and I'll just be going back home. But I sat my kids down and I said to, I said to my son, my son had said to me, Dad, just apologise, man, please. Yeah. And I'll get, I'll get emotional. Fit. And I said, I can't. Yeah. I can't anyway. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to. And if they want to send me back to jail, they can send me back to jail. Yeah. But jail for me is possible death. That's how I feel, because it's controlled by radical gangs. So, but I said to him, I said, son, look at your sisters, yeah. Right? There's girls this age that are being taken from their families. They're being hurt, they're being tortured. They're having the worst things you could ever imagine take, done to them by 10 men at a time. Yeah? If they send me a jail, I know it's gonna blow up. Yeah? I know more people are gonna look at this issue. It's gonna bring more attention to this issue. Yeah? So again, for me, as my, my job, send me a jail. Yeah? Go on, please. Yeah? For my cause, send me a jail. I don't wanna go to jail. I love my family, I love my kids. But I explained that to my kids, I said, son, if that, if that video goes out and just one girl, if I, go guilt, if I walk out and I'm sent to jail, and one girl, like your sister, is saved from that, yeah? And I have to sit in a box for three months or four months or six months, yeah? What should I do? And he said, you're right, Dad. I said, good, and I don't know if I should have put it on him like that, because I put it on him for him to tell me you can go to jail. Like, cause I knew I was gonna go to jail. But I didn't wanna, I don't know what resentment I've, I've even caused, or I may have caused as they grow older. I get a upset. Because I know, yeah. You okay. Hyundai. I'm not choosing the greater good over my kids <laughs> at the end of the day. Me, me personally though. Or see a lot, man. And I, and I try, try to explain. For me, I'm talking about my situation, not his situation. I'm in any situation not choosing the very good over my daughter. No. Explain to your, your wife at the time. This isn't about my kids. And I said that this isn't about our kids. And if you look, and I, I look at things quite deeply, yeah, and I think about things deeply. And I think our previous generations kissed their kids goodbye. Some of them were 15 and pretended they were 16 to go to war, yeah? And they run into fields with a life expectancy of minutes. What did they do that for? They done that to hand down a safe and prosperous future for the next generation. What are we currently doing? People ain't even speaking. People are too scared to even talk about it. Like if you look around your country, or I look around my town and say, is, is this changing for the better? No. Is our country changed? Can anyone look at our country and say 30 years ago to where we're at now, is it changed for the better? Is crime better? Is any of these problems better? It's getting worse and worse and worse. And we're silenced. And they have most people mortgaged up to the hill, most people financed up to the hill, most people too scared to talk. And I was too scared to talk. I was that person. Well, that's why I wore a mask and used a fake name. I, at the time of starting the English Defence League, between me and my partner, there were seven properties. We had seven properties and two... I almost want to say this is coming off as as this should sound like branding or something. This is I'm gonna go out here and make myself sound as good as possible. This is. 
I was one of the people who could just go, well, I moved to a nice village, yeah? But then I look and think, what is, your, what is my duty? My duty as a father, so I look at my kids, I know, I know that as we- Just trying to appeal to the heart of humans. <laughs> go forward in the years, I know I can sit there and comfortably say, I've done everything I could. I pushed it as far as I could, and I'm still pushing it now. And, and, and the, the, the fear I have is not from Muslims, yeah, which, in fact, I get quite a good reaction. You'd be surprised. Most people would be surprised. You only see the two second clips that go on the internet where someone wants to punch me, yeah? Most Muslims have come up to a very understanding and very just want to talk and Tommy, explain this and all right, Tommy, bruv. Mad, it's mad. It's quite a mad experience because you'd expect the opposite. How would you measure your success? How would I measure my success? Um, I've done it on a graph before because up until the formation of the English Defence League, the arrest rate was like this for sexual exploitation in gangs, yeah? English Defence League forms here, it literally goes like that. Yeah? Um, the cities we went to were forced to address the issues. We were screaming on the streets about the rape of our daughters. Screaming. Um, I look at the success. So members of the Sikh community had formed a Sheila Punjab, uh, an organisation to tackle this issue. But they hadn't managed to burst it onto the scene. Yeah? They'd fought it within their own community, within their close-knit community. They'd been battling it and men had been going to jail for years trying to protect their daughters. Yeah? Um, and it seems that when that resistance was formed from the Sikh community, they just went all out on every other community, the gangs did. Now, no one would talk about it, now people are talking about it, and they're going to jail for it, but they're still not doing a, a good enough job, so I'd measure my success on that. Um, I'd measure my success on the fact that I've been cancelled, but I'm still talking. Uh, even the fact that I'm sat here is a success for me. Who funds your agenda? Um, people. So. Uh, individuals with donations. Don't believe the bullshit, don't believe the hype. There's no multi-million pound donors or funders that have given me, any, give me money. Um, literally individuals. So we funded the English Defence League at the start ourselves. The first ever demonstration, I paid 450 pounds to have a professional cameraman come and film what happened with the police, everything, when we were the UPL. And it was that video, so I'd done that, I paid 450 pounds, and, and then that video I put out online and it had hundreds of thousands of views, yeah? And I said, when are we, and I called it loot and protest, and I said, when are we going to stand up to what's going on? And then I went on football casual boards and messaged it everywhere. But we were funded by ourselves like that, and even, even now, say like I work for a company called Urban Scoop, to do the most important journalism and investigative journalism anyone's doing in the UK, tackling these men who have got away with the heinous crimes of rape against children. It's funded by monthly subscribers, £5 a month, £10 a month, £50 a month, and it's not funded enough to even cover the bills, really. Like, we struggle and we've got so much important work to do, so don't believe the, uh, the nonsense. Tell me, what would you say is the worst memory of your life? The worst memory of my life? Um, I've had a few, man. So where was I, Winchester Prison? Uh, Winchester Prison, and I was sat there, and my mum was going in for a 13-hour operation that they didn't know if she'd come out of. So the priest had come to the door, yeah, you'll get me, oh, you'll get me going again, man. <laughs> Please come to the door and then you, I sit and think about the worry you've caused them. <laughs> My mum's a mad little Irish woman who is the kindest, most nice woman you'll ever meet in your life. And at the start of even my activism, she worked in a Catholic school. And um, I had everyone sit and beg me to stop. Family members, of how it's affecting them. She was threatened with her job at the time. Um, about who her son was. That all changed over the years though. I've seen the change in everything. But yeah, she was a, uh, so that, probably that moment because you sit thinking what's going on and then, you, and then you relive everything and think, Jesus man, I've caused my mum murders. Even before the English Defence League, even before my activism, I'd never had a clean fucking, I would have caused her worry that now as a parent, I think, Jesus man, what would I do if my son was doing this? How worried would I be? <laughs> So yeah, I caused them a lot of worry and I think that was a bad night. But she come through it, she come through it, or she didn't expect to come through it, she come through it, and, uh, and I was in jail, so it's obviously, poof, it's on your head anyway. On the back of that, what would you say is the, the best memory of your life? It, every positive memory I have is when I'm on holiday. And I think that comes from, it's when I relax. So, it's when I can, I, I don't know if it's, uh, so we're, even when I'm at home with the fa family here, it's, it's, there's never really much peace, because it's chaos, man. I like to call it organised chaos, but it's chaos. But when I get, away, get, get out of the country, I just, I'm, I, then I feel that I can be, because there's Tommy Robinson. And there's yeah, I gotta see, I gotta see all the clips now at this point. I'm gonna go look up a Tommy Robinson compilation or something, because like, I think that he's, he came on here 
with the set purpose of making himself sound very likable and appealing to them to an audience. That's what I'm getting out of here, and I feel like it's all cap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, Stephen. Yeah, I'm a family man. I've got three kids. Um, You're not that much of a family man, though, because you chose your activisionism over your kids' safety and peace of mind. So, yeah, stop saying that. Your family is, your, your wife left you. <laughs> you let that happen. As a family man. Tony Robbins is an activist who, who ain't gonna give up. <laughs> yeah, you're an activist, for sure. But then, try and balance the two. And I've balanced two. It's impossible. Do quite well, I think, because I switch off. So when I'm you know, <laughs> all right. With my family, I'm not answering the phone about them and politics. I'm, my kids aren't seeing it. They aren't seeing the negativity. Um, they might sense the negativity, or they might sense the stress sometimes from it. But that's been my happiest moments. My only happy moments when I'm out of this country. <laughs> As well, what are your views on the war in Ukraine currently? I believe the war in Ukraine has been instigated by expansionist ideas of the European Union. I believe it's globalism. I believe they've prodded and prodded and prodded since 2014 when there was the overthrowing of a democratically elected government in Ukraine and replaced with a puppet who is Zelensky. And that puppet went on an offensive and neo-Nazi gangs went on an offensive attacking the minority, which was the Russians. Um, and they were, 60 of them set on fire in one day. No one ever faced prosecution. Yeah, there was lots of crimes, the banning of the speaking Russian in all the schools. Um, and right now, racism against Russians is encouraged. It's insane, yeah? It's insane. I'd look at what you've done to Roman Abramovich and Chelsea Football Club. I just think, so what? Because he owned a company that sold some steel to make weapons for Russia. You've now took everything off him, yeah? But you deal with Saudi Arabia, who have been bombing kids in Yemen for the last 10 years. They've been blowing up schools every week, or uh, they're, they're murdering. Yeah? You fund all the missiles there. You give them all the weapons. So the hypocrisy in it and the agenda of it and the breakdown of it. So there were certain areas of, that felt like they were liberated when the Russians come in. Yeah? Don't get me wrong, I think what's happening to innocent Ukrainians in the middle of this plan. And since 2014, they've done this and it's all orchestrated. And I believe it's gone against all the agreements they previously had with Russia. And I believe that expansionist ideas is, is the European Union. It's our government's disgusting foreign policies. Um, and right now there's lots of innocent Ukrainians in the middle of that. That doesn't mean Putin's a nice guy, doesn't mean their agenda isn't disgusting as well, but it's been instigated because they, Ukraine used to borrow off of Putin. They used to get all their resources off of Putin. They used to deal with Putin. There's a lot of rich resources in that country of Ukraine and the globalist agenda wants it. They want rid of Putin as well. Yeah? Just like they got rid of Saddam Hussein, just like they got rid of Gaddafi, just like they tried to get rid of Assad. Why couldn't you get rid of Assad? Probably because of his connections as well with Russia. Yeah? But you wanted rid of Assad. What are you replacing him with? Look what you've done to, look what you've done with Libya. It's disgusting, man. And that is foreign policy. Now that is- You got that man started. You asked him one question here. You didn't. The British, as I've come to grow, I've just come to be disgusted with much of our history of what our governments have done, what the elitist globalist agenda is. Um, they talk about democracy. They keep going about protecting democracy in, in Ukraine. Just research it. Research what's going on in Ukraine and research who's behind it. George Soros again, billionaires, the people who are sitting in the WEF meetings now, planning our next future of our lives, where they're gonna globalize and digitalize all of us as slaves, basically. So I just, and I think, and I think, do you know what? When I look at that, my views have shifted a lot. My views have been against Islam, and th this is the biggest threat. Uh, I believe we've, we're all being used. They've played us against each other, even down to the immigration they're bringing in. They want us all broken into little sections. They want us into you're gay, you're straight, you're black, you're white, all broken, yeah? Because if we were united against them, yeah, and what they're doing, because they're taking all of our freedoms, the, what they are doing now, and what they're planning now, and from, we won't say the word, because you might get this, a strike on this, begins with C, yeah, ends in D, we know what we're talking about, but all of this, yeah, is part of their agenda, and Ukraine's part of that. And um, I feel sorry for the Ukrainians who are stuck in the middle. Tommy, thank you for your time, and before we finish off, is there anything that you'd like to say? Um, no, just don't believe the headlines, yeah? Just read past the headlines and listen to what I say, not what they say I say. And uh, that doesn't mean I'm perfect and I'm not claiming to sit here and polish my halo because I've done a lot of mistakes as well, but I am an ordinary person, yeah? Trying to fight what for what I feel is right.
Feel to leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bell. Send me the links, y'all, because it's something fishy about this video.